Hello and welcome to Castle of Horror Hangout episode. This week we are discussing Frankenstein Conquers the World. It is a 1965 kaiju film that we've been wanting to get to for a long time. And the whole purpose of the Hangout episodes is that we we try to hit movies that we won't necessarily do in the main line of Castle of Horror. With me, as always, are Tony Salvaggio, tech director at Rooster Teeth, lead singer of the band Deserts of Mars and lead guitarist of the band Rise from Fire. Say hello, Mr. Tony. Howdy. And Mr. Drew Edwards, creator of the long-running underground very popular comic book series, Halloween Man, also in Austin. Say hello. Fire bad, but apparently radiation good. <laughs> radiation very good. Uh, yeah, I mean, he has sort of the powers of King Kong. And I'm Jason. Uh, I, I write things. Uh, the most recent book is Young Captain Nemo, Quest for the Nautilus, which you can find right now. Uh, okay, so yes, uh, the movie this week is Frankenstein Conquers the world it's from toho which are the the wonderful people who brought you godzilla uh tony i think it may have been your idea to to do this no it was drew explain to me guys how we wound up talking about this movie um well tony said he wanted to do something crazy from japan this is a crazy japanese movie that i always loved when i was a kid i also like its sequel war of the gargantuas which we are doing next week Mm. So I threw that out there, and this is where we ended. I mean, this that, that's about right, wouldn't you say, Tony? Yeah. I mean, strangely enough, War of the Gargantuas is really easy to find. Frankenstein yes. Conquers the World, not so easy to find. Why is that? But, why, why? I mean, I've I never seen them. I guess everybody loves two monsters. Yeah. More than they... I don't... Who knows, man? We live in a weird world. But this one has a lot of... Watching it, though, it's got a lot more meat than I remember it. Mm-hmm. I guess because I've seen Gargantua's a bunch more. Like, yes. for whatever reason, Monster Theater and all of the subsidiaries throughout the ages got Gargantua's for cheap or something. I don't know. Yes. But this one, not really. But maybe because it's also a little bit weightier, I think. Well, it's yeah, certainly... It's, it's, it, go ahead, it's, go ahead, Drew. I'm sorry. It's, it's very tied to World War II... Yeah. And I mean, a lot of the, you know, a lot of the Japanese monster films evoke World War II, but this one is like, actually, like you have Nazis, which, yeah. you know, it seems like a lot of Japanese films kind of really go pretty far out of their way not to show that Japan was in league with a nation of white supremacists mm. <laughs> um, yeah. during the war. This one doesn't really gloss over the, the, that they were teamed up with the Nazis. Um, then you, you, it actually takes large chunks of it take place in Hiroshima. Um, yes. you know, it's, it's, it's just a, you know, this is a heavy movie at times. And yet it also has to like crisscross giving you everything that you will want out of a Frankenstein mo movie, but also everything you want out of a giant monster movie. And somehow it is all these things. <laughs> So, so to, to talk just a moment about, about the, the World War II thing, what blows me away is that this movie comes out in 1965 and it opens with this segment of the war. And we'll talk about the, what actually happens in this sequence. But it is like a, a perfect techno thriller, Tom Clancy-esque opening, you know, showing how, yeah. or, or, or Cussler. It's really like something out of Clive Cussler because you have a thing in this case, the heart of the Frankenstein monster that just bounces from place to place almost comically uh, in in this sort of, you know, uh, in this sort of chase, you know, to where it winds up, you know, starting this film. But this is just 20 years after the bombing of Hiroshima, and they actually use the bombing of Hiroshima to launch a a a really silly giant monster plot. And what's weird to me about that is I, what I don't understand about the Japanese culture and, and, or, or I'm sorry, about the Japanese pop culture, assuming that their giant monster movies indicate anything about the culture, because that might be going too far. But, but it seems very strange to me because it's been 20 years since 9-11, um, since right? And we still couldn't do... Oh, you know, 9-11 happened and this uh, particular irradiated thing got powdered in toxic dust um, and that created a giant well, monster. I don't well, think you could do that. Well, um, they didn't do a giant monster, but on the strain, 
they did have vampires living in Ground Zero. Okay. Well, I mean, again, isn't we talk about a lot? Isn't horror the way that you deal with things a lot of times? I think. I, think I mean, so. certainly in Fifty Four Godzilla, that's what they're, we're dealing with. And now, yes. eleven years later, they're saying, "Hey, you know, this is a more humanized. This is a, as he starts out not gargantuous. He looks all mossy and really different. Yeah. But in this, there's still uh, a more human. He's more like a wild boy than anything else. And uh, <laughs> and it's crazy too because it would have been fine to just have basically the amazing colossal man, right? Yeah. But yes. he's a giant kaiju style monster. And, but and we they should, also we bring actually... in Baragon. Yes. Like, like just to up the ante. And if you watch the, uh, and we can get to it later, but if you watch the like extra credits thing, there's also a surprise giant octopus, which isn't in the AIP version but there's there's a super weird thing <laughs> where where we we want to track like what's actually in this movie but also how this movie came to be but but yeah the where this movie came from as a concept was toho wanted to do king kong what is it no not king kong they wanted to do godzilla versus frankenstein and somehow they decided uh, you know, and various variations thereof. And right. somehow they decided not to use Godzilla versus Frankenstein. So they had a different monster and then they did the Frankenstein. But their Frankenstein story winds up really taking up almost all of the movie until like the mystery of this other monster starts showing up about. Well, like, basi- basically, Baragon is there to have someone to kind of framing Frankenstein for... This yes. is a movie that's very obsessed with animal... Uh, like like basically cattle and livestock mutilation yes like yeah that gets crazy too that's probably another reason why it wasn't as popular as gargantuas so ex- explain to me though the the bouncing ball of the frank of the the heart of the frankenstein monster well, T- tony can you walk us through well, r- like real, what happens with this thing real quick though i i want to say one of mm. the things i do love about the intro of this movie is that for like a hot minute when you see that battlefield like and i i have to believe this was on purpose it looks like a graveyard at the opening of the the james whale frankenstein yeah because and it's the frankenstein was, uh, castle yeah absolutely. it's it's a japanese version of you know more or less put together just from memory of uh well hey it's the castle of frankenstein where he's working on a monster so show what what's that like and first the set director's like i don't know but it's gonna start with the with the graveyard and some gnarly trees and and smoke and fog by, oh by the way it it was king kong versus frankenstein first ah and then it was gonna be godzilla and then it or you know, there was talk of Godzilla. Yes. Instead. Oh, and it, well, it became King Kong versus Godzilla. Right. And then the Frankenstein stuff got pushed to its own movie. And then also the cutest Baragon <laughs> in, the, in the pantheon of Baragons. Are there multiple Baragons? Well, I mean, he looks, a, it's like Godzilla. He looks a little different each. So he shows up often. Okay. Well, I, I mean, yeah, he's, yeah. All right. Uh, the, uh, but it's, but uh, e- either of you, if you would like to, if you would like to give us, the the curious passage of the heart of Frankenstein because it's fascinating how many things it go it starts in the castle and then it moves right yeah well they come and take it it's a almost a silent like no I don't know if it's just the AIP because I haven't watched the subtitle one in I don't even remember the last time I got to no there's see no it. dialogue there's like nothing yeah there's, and there's a know, very and frustrated thing. mad scientist yeah well I mean they just stole his his family's life's work for yeah and then they they go they bring it by U boat. And they threaten him, and he's angry. And then they go by U-boat um, and get detected. They pass it off to a, a Japanese submarine. Right. And then that goes to a lab. In Hiroshima. Which, yeah, which immediately gets bombed <laughs> not long after. And they go, oh, it's in that. And they, so they show him, and it's the heart. And they go, hey, this thing stays alive. Whatever frankenstein did to it i mean they call right. the monster frankenstein so whatever yeah let's we'll go with dr it. frankenstein whatever he did uh caused immortality which i yep. guess goes back to the prometheus myth right where he regrows he's tortured every day and then regrows it absolutely yeah. so i think you know again there's a lot of meat like it's easy to get into the monster parts and you know it ends with some monster wrestling it's great but I, there's a lot more to this and uh you know so they the they nick adams character really is trying to piece all this stuff together yes you know he feels remorse i mean he's his delivery sometimes doesn't say like remorse 
<laughs> it's it's worth talking about Nick Adams here. We've seen before in, in Monster X, right? And and he, um, is that the name of that movie? Anyway, uh, and Nick Adams, this blonde actor who was in a number of, of Japanese films at the time, monster movies, I'm sure he did other stuff. And his character is a doctor who says in a line of dialogue, I was involved in the creation of the atomic bomb. And so I came back to Japan to see if I could work for, for good. And here's another question that I have about the culture is, you know, this is a movie, again, just 20 years after, again, it's just to put it in our heads, it's 20 years after 9-11, right? This is a movie about how an American involved in that great uh, terror has come to Japan and he's the hero of the film. And they, you know, so this movie is perfectly at, at, at ease with the fact that you might work to better yourself. You know, and and what I was thinking was, is there any Japanese pop culture that you guys are aware of that has the opposite message? I say that because Black Rain, if you think of like the terrible American film Black Rain, which was exciting but exploitative, it was all about these angry Japanese mobsters who, who were still, you know, angry about the, the atomic war. But I've, I'm not aware of any actual like Japanese movies that express that kind of, of anger. Instead, what we have is this, which is a whole hymn to, you know, uh, well, to you'll see betterment. it. I mean, you're, it's not in monster movies, but I mean, there's definitely there's a lot of. Yeah, that's a typical American thing. I mean, Shin Godzilla has America yeah. sweeping in, come like taking all the stuff for profit. And, you know, and then I was watching it going. Damn it! That's exactly what America would do, <laughs> and they're all just like, "Can you believe what America's doing?" Yeah. Which Shin Godzilla is still like one of those movies where I'm amazed that it can be so very anti uh, red tape and government inefficiency, mm-hmm. and so nationalist at the same time. And it doesn't seem like those would work, and yet that movie does it almost perfectly. I guess but there are the yes. Americans I mean, I mean, in or or Go look ahead. at. You know, Godzilla 85, where yep. we're just, you know, swinging it around. And it's the Russians. If you look at the Japanese version, the Russians are actually trying to save things. Yes. America's useless. Right. Or worse than and, useless. And dangerous. Or, or Akira, right. where we just kind of go off, like, the, the if you look at the manga anyway, like, America has, is one of the coalition of nations that has um, a fleet off of Japan going, what the hell's going on in Japan whenever things get really, really crazy? We send spies, but yeah. they're definitely not the good guys. I mean, so, yeah, America kind of... I know this isn't a Godzilla movie, but it's it's in, in that vein. Um, is like, America kind of in a way is a lot like Godzilla and that it is both powerful and destructive and can be misdirected. However, <laughs> and, and However also remember that you're yeah. talking about an era where if you remember the court scene from Godzilla 54, yeah. there were concerns on if that was if they could shoot that or do it correctly mm. because of the occupation. Right. So you're not gonna see too much of that until the footing kind of comes up. And I, again, there's people who because are way more scholarly about this than, than I. And so I'm not going to speak too much on it. I'm purely pop culture. Yeah. Um, there, there, I know people who would have a way more scholarly approach and would probably school us on all of this. Uh, so I don't want to get too much into it, but there's, but I'd, I'd love to hear those answers. I, I'd you're not going to get like, that out of, out of this. Um, what's, what's, you know. what's interesting about me, about this, this movie to me though, also is like, it's dealing with all this like world war, War II stuff and sort of the the shock waves of World War II, but it's also a movie that is appropriating a Western pop culture character yeah. and transplanting him into a Japanese style of giant monster movie, which is mm-hmm. which is a very specific thing, and I I. I think that's why I've always been kind of fascinated by this movie. Not that, you know, it's perfect, although I think it's pretty good. You know, like I, I, I you know, I, I'll get into that stuff later. But um, like even the fact that like the, the Frankenstein character, like he he doesn't specifically have like the Jack Pierce Frankenstein makeup, but like he's got like the flat head and everything. So, right. you, you know, once he's grown to like enormous size... 
you know, and he's fighting this dinosaur with a heat ray, you do effectively have, you know, Frankenstein, ver- like, like visually, at least a little bit, Frankenstein versus Godzilla. And Absolutely. That's, that's kind of fascinating to me. It's it's hilar- hilarious and wonderful. And anybody who bitches about it are missing the point entirely. It's wonderful that he has a flathead. That is fabulous. You know, that, that, that yeah. he, that, you know, that, that you organically grow this guy into Frankenstein and but when he takes his form like this is a cartoon or something he has a flat head so it suggests to us well you know, the classic concept of frankenstein well also if you believe how it's kind of structured the idea is that he's he's gonna do that because that's how frankenstein looks yes go with that if you're going for that universal horror look yeah. that description because he's like a starfish by the right you know, they, they have him where they're like, hey, you know how to test to see if he's a Frankenstein. Cut off his arm, which is right. monstrous, the way that they treat this this poor creature. Well, I mean, even at the beginning like when the they wife. find him, when he's grown, when he's, you know, grown into this, it's kind of this feral kid. Yeah. They watch him get hit by a car and they just throw him like, Ooh. Yeah. and that's a very kind of, <laughs> it makes sense culturally. <laughs> it's still, these are two. Do- By the way, these are two doctors who watch. I love. Who watch I love like, how, yeah, go ahead. him get hit by a car, and yeah. they're like, "I want to help, but here's some package of take some food, guy who got hit by a car. We could come check out your ankle, but ooh, I don't know if we want to get involved. Right? I Although love better than a day after all. all. <laughs> yeah. I I love the one the one scientist who is basically dr asshole md like like oh, yes you know, like like he, he's like all in you know like to the point where he's gonna cut off the frankenstein's arm behind their back while they're they're making right. hamburgers yeah he's like hey go go over there i surely i'm not gonna go visit the, the frankenstein monster and, yeah uh, cut off Ken. his arm that would be terrible if i did that i'm gonna go do something else that doesn't that's, involve vivisection or Ken or Ken Chiro, I mean, he that guy that guy will promote any bad idea in this movie. <laughs> Anything that is a bad idea, he will say it. There's a point where where he's like, um, "Well, you know, the I, I'm not making this up. I'm not exaggerating or anything." He goes, "Well, you know that uh, all the things that he's done, they're gonna kill him." The monster, when the army kills him, they'll blow him to smithereens. I really would like to have his heart and brain because we need to study it. So I am at ease with this problem. <laughs> and it's, just, it's so fabulous. He's so fabulously just, just, I don't even know what the, what the, he's, I, I and he's he's pathological something he's amazing um yes and the, and his friends though because i guess this might be another cultural thing because he's you know with it, he's a doctor he can speak for himself his friends are just like well that's kenjiro we're not going to stop hanging out with him we're we're going to continue to be his friend even though He's kind of a total psycho when it comes to this, this monster. Yes. Right. Well, he, 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 you know, he does end up having to eat a little bit of uh, humble pie by the end of it because, like, he totally gets saved from, from Baragon by yes. uh, by Frankenstein. That's true. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. What's crazy, yep. though, too, is they, he starts to, so, you know, they find this wild boy. He's been a legend for a while. Mm-hmm. Um, they, you know, luckily somebody has, uh, you know, a a little bit of you know, Doctor Suica has has uh, some compassion. <laughs> yes, and uh, she's like, maybe we shouldn't treat this guy because they're chasing him. I mean, the villagers are chasing him around. Yes, and so, but once he's been to, to to survive, he's been eating right. rabbits and rabbits. And yeah, them. I mean, he's been eating also, their their dogs. Yes, also, which... I mean. <laughs> Frankenstein movie, you have to have villagers chase them around. I exactly. didn't think about that. Yeah, you're right. That's right. Oh, yeah, this okay. movie is surprisingly observant of yeah. Frankenstein tropes. Yeah, you're right. No, I think, I mean, but I think that they, you know, it's, I, I don't even know if I say surprisingly because it's, it's a Frankenstein movie. Like, yeah, are you going to do, that's I'm, true. I think, I think other Frankenstein movies, more modern Frankenstein movies possibly could learn some things from this one. Yeah, they do oh, less. Like, what, what yeah. surprise? I, th- I think what you're talking about surprise is you don't expect a kaiju movie exactly to yeah. to be so observant. But in but they're it didn't, you know you're talking to people to who be. know how to make monster movies. They're yeah. gonna have watched monster movies. Like if anybody's <laughs> gonna do it, these you know these guys who love monster movies and make monster movies, they're the ones who are gonna know that. So mm-hmm. I, I I get where you're coming from, but I also like 
it wasn't as surprising when you when you really think about it and what they're trying to do. Oh no, you're 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 absolutely right. I just it's like I it did it, it um a lesser movie. I think, and this is why I said this. You know, I actually think this is a pretty good movie. You know, like like we did we did a movie yeah. last week. We, you know, we did a movie last week that is sort of a it's so bad as it's good kind of movie. Like this this movie, I would actually say is pretty. You know, it, it clips along. It's got its ideas. It's you know, and I you know I think you know a lot of movies would be like, okay, we're going to do a movie about a giant radioactive Frankenstein. And they just would have been lazy about it and not actually thought like, okay, what, what's the stuff that we're going to take from other Frankenstein movies that need the Like, what do we need to observe? Like, what is the tropes of the Frankenstein film? And the, you know, this, this movie is that it is, it is both very much a giant monster movie and a very much a Frankenstein movie. And that's one of the things I really appreciate about it. Like I, 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 you're right. It could have just ended up being like amazing colossal man, and Absolutely. you know, but they they chose they chose to let it be Frankenstein. I also I also think that um, with the exception of a couple of like the farm animals, yeah, um, I think the miniature work and like the forced perspective stuff in this movie is actually really good. Like there's a there you know there's a scene at one point where and I know I'm jumping around but like, <clears throat> no please I, 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 I want to talk about this while I'm thinking about this where a bunch of soldiers are shooting at Frankenstein and you see his like shadow lumbering at them out of this cave yeah and it that is a wonderful shot like it looks terrific mm -hmm. yeah yeah there's a lot i mean you you get an occasional like some of the matting didn't look as good like there's like blue halos around some things but other than that and they, there's even a nod to king kong where he shows up at her door at her window yes like, oh, I love that moment. <laughs> it's a, it's a wonderful. Cool stuff. I, well, if I had seen this as a kid, I would because I find it fascinating that again I have never seen this movie until last night. Uh, oh wow! I was aware of it, Tony, because I used to get Cracked magazine, and <laughs> yeah, they yeah, would yeah. always they would always lift stills from stuff like this and the Amazing Colossal Man and and, and whatever. Right. It, but they never credited like what anything was. So I would go my whole life going, "What the hell is that?" And so often they would use the giant Frankenstein, which I find just hilarious because this is like 15 years after, after this came out. Um, but yeah, I never, I never saw it. Cause it's exactly like you said, I don't, I, it, this might be on DVD. It's not available on any of the streaming services. That makes no, no sense. You, can, to me, you yeah. can get it on DVD, but the yeah. DVDs are like ex reasonably expensive. It was like 30 really? bucks last time I checked. Yeah. I missed, there was a window and I, this is one of the ones that I missed. Mm -hmm. um there was a there were a couple others that i eventually got i think i got them through the criterion versions but there's a time period where if you miss something like that's it um i find it strange what turns up it. on on criterion by the way i mean the notion like cri the criterion channel is where you're going to find uh the war of the gargantuas i mean meaning no disrespect to war of the gargantuas because it is what it is and, and you and i like that sort of thing but isn't Criterion where you're supposed to find the Magnificent Ambersons and 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 yeah? But also, I mean, if you look through their catalog, it is. I mean, Gargantuas was was Gargantuas Honda as well. Yeah, yeah, Gargantua yeah. So I mean, Honda. that's why that's why you're seeing it. I mean, you're talking Toho, mm -hmm. which you know that's the thing. In fact, that made a lot of people really pissed off that Gargantuas and a couple others weren't in the Godzilla Blu-ray mm, set. I see, and. Yeah. In fact, people would leave one star reviews, which I think is just a bullshit fucking tactic. I agree. Like, because yeah. at no point did Criterion say we are putting the Gargantua series out. They right. said, it, in fact, their very first press release was here are the Godzilla movies we're putting in this box set. Yeah. And then you'll get some jackass. Yeah. Who's just got a like an axe to grind like i can see like i was expecting this godzilla movie with this print and this matting right yeah or the subtitles i don't like how they did the subtitles there's a problem or i have a bad disc but yeah. i it freaking galls me when people give like this spoon was not a knife right no like, absolutely what? it never said it was a knife <laughs> Ever. This thing that's clearly blue is not red. And I just, I cannot, I have to give this a one star because it's not red. It, but it never said it was red. Uh, yes, I know, but I, one star because I wanted it that way. Like, <laughs> Admittedly, I would love someone to put out, because these are, if you look at like Frankenstein, Gargantua, there's just the two movies. 
Yeah. Right. Why isn't there like a at least it's, a midnight movies? It's the rights, and that's part of why. I there's think something about the rights. There's got to be. I mean, if you can yeah. watch Gargantuas, so you're saying oh, I've forgotten that Gargantuas is on the Criterion Channel. Yes, if I recall. So if I it, it is, is no. they had um what movie channel was it that had? So they had the reason that is it's a whole rights thing where they own that part. And that's also part of why they couldn't put it out. And I know there's a couple of people who will school me on this as well. But yeah, but that, that I mean, that's the why the speculation, why people were angry that it wasn't on there. But like I said, it's stupid because it never, they never ever said that they weren't. Yeah. Just get the channel and, and watch it on, was it uh, TCM maybe? Well, t- t- so, so anyway, it may well have been on TCM. It, there, there's also this this weird thing recently. Um, we're getting far afield, but nobody sure. Cares. The 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 you've got the you've got the Warner uh, you've got the Warner Library, right? Because you because you work for a for a Warner company. Is, is, uh, I mean, I don't yeah. know what all's on it. Possibly yes. Okay, so here's the thing. Used to be there was a public facing Warner Archive thing, and right. And I now paid, it's, I mean, it's the, it, now it's just the DVDs. Like you can yes, and it was expensive. You know, I mean, it was like like you know, as like I, it was at least ten dollars a month, um, which is expensive considering that Netflix costs that much, right? And this was just for Warner stuff. However, it had all all this kind of stuff that that once it went off, you can't even like I can't get Surfside Six on DVD, you right. know. You can't get I mean, Lion Eye. You're gonna so, have to check uh, what's on HBO Max, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's possible that they will release that stuff in HBO Max. Anyway, no yeah. but yeah. So, but I agree with you that this stuff should be in print better. But I guarantee you, it's it's like anything. I mean, I, yeah. I found out recently uh, somebody had posted one of my favorite things as a kid was uh, Space Giants. Yes. And there's a company that owns Space Giants. They've approached them. They want to put out Ambassador Magma, but you can't do that without doing Space Giants. Right. And they said, hey, so why don't why don't we handle that? Like, you just let us make it and sell it. And Space Giants uh, owners were like, no, nah, we're just going to sit on it. Like, that sounds like work. Yeah. And yeah. that's just what happens. And it's frustrating. But... I don't there's know. there's the work of digital so I, I get it and to some extent at least warner i kind of get the impression they didn't expect anybody to subscribe to that service i i hope that's the case and they were just using it as an excuse to do the production work of digitizing all those old shows and they're going to use it again probably for hbo max but yeah there's the work of that there's the work of music clearance if you have to deal with that shows like square pegs took a long damn time to come out well, on dvd wkrp was the worst you yeah, just couldn't do it right because there's so much to clear but uh, you know uh, the bigger the company the more that's possible there are humans who work for disney who can do stuff like like clearing the rights on on different shows but i don't know yeah. um but anyway uh so, <laughs> yeah but i mean i agree that it should be it should be easier to get this movie. It's super because again, weird there's a have. lot of stuff like Nick Adams' character. Yeah, uh, you know he's he's plays a typical Toho Nick Adams character. Yeah, but in the moments in the moments where he's really thinking about it, when he at the beginning when he's doing his rounds and this woman hands him this ornate pillow and it's basically like her and everybody else knows he doesn't know because he's he's been there a while but he hasn't been there long enough. Yeah, he doesn't seem to realize and everybody's kind of walking around, kind of side glancing this woman's they think this is the last act like she's really really dead so because they're like oh she died like no not yet just mm -hmm," you know yeah but he gets it but he doesn't quite get it but all of the stuff that's both culturally significant and dealing with the legacy of the bomb and his when he's trying to save the monster he doesn't feel as close as you know his his girlfriend (laughs) Mm-hmm. He's really, uh, you know, stricken with, you know, how human this this monster is. Yeah. Um, but he's still like, even if we don't treat him normally, um, even if we can't deal with a giant monster, he could still help science in a way that maybe we can have people regrow organs or. Yes, he and, has. He and has it's not ignorance. in a capitalist way. It's in a like, I am a man of science. I really messed up. Yeah. I feel somewhat remorseful for that to the fact where he's going to go home and, and scrap everything because he doesn't feel like he's done enough. Yeah. And he has to start from, from scratch. And so when he's dealing with this, so you have these three aspects, you know, that, that are really 
pretty fascinating. You have the very cold Japanese doctor. You have the very compassionate uh, Japanese male doctor. The Japanese female doctor is very compassionate. Yeah, Dr. And Suka. then you have Nick Adams, who is ignorant of Japanese ways, but is also quite compassionate, you know, and, and, and trying. You're right. You know, you're, you're, you're totally right. Um, does he, is he in Gargantua's? I, forgive me for not remembering. No, I could it's, have sworn... um, it's essentially the same character, but it's, uh, God, what is that guy's name? Oh, it he's, says it's Russ Tamlin. He's also oh, says yeah. he's the Haunting. Yeah, Russ Tamlin of The Haunting, yes. And of uh, Twin Peaks. Yeah, amazing guy. So, yes. And of, like, Seven Brides for Seven Brothers. He's an amazing dancer, Russ Tamlin. Oh, I'd forgotten. Uh, 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 Kumi Mizuno. Is was in Matongo. Matongo is that the, the one mushroom? Of the mushroom people. people. Wow. Yes. Well, you know, the, there are several actors that we spot here. There's, there's the, um, there's the older doctor uh, at Hiroshima who right. I know that actor. I know him, and I just can't remember who it is. Yeah. Anyway, so. Um, but what's what's also interesting is they they do because they need a, a sort of Godzilla, which they didn't. <laughs> I don't even know if they really needed it, but it does make for an interesting film. Um. You get Baragon rampaging, and nobody knows if it's because it's not until one person goes, "Yeah, I saw a creature that I blocked out of my memory because it was so horrifying that right. everything was getting destroyed at the time." Um, that everybody's like, "Oh, well, the this creature must be rampaging because Baragon's eating livestock and just ripping everything down." Yes, <laughs> but it's just it's so crazy. Although he's such a goofy looking monster, I, I mean, know. Baragon... <laughs> Yes, he, he eats people and, and cows, eyes. but he does. He looks he looks like a sort of a funny. He looks like a floppy eared Japanese dragon from like an old painting, you know, with the with the the big grin and the and the giant eyes and, and floppy ears. And you know, there's in something. King Caesar should be in a sitcom. Yes, yeah, so <laughs> right. Oh my goodness, like cute monsters. Yeah, actually, to be honest with you, if you like this movie. If you go out and find it after you're, you've heard us ramble about it, uh, I really, really, really think you should watch Ultra Q. Right. Like, get the get the latest Blu-rays that have come out for Ultra Q, because I just think you can't go wrong. I mean, it's similar. There's, like, three main characters, kind of X-Files. I always describe it. It's like the precursor to Ultraman. So you get X-Files, Kaiju, and Outer Limits. Yeah. All in one package. Yeah. Where can you watch Ultra Q now? Uh... Oh, so the Blu-ray, Mill Creek produced the Blu-rays, and there's like a steelbook version and a non-steelbook version. Of course, as soon as they put it out, true purists were like, why couldn't you get this? Because right when they put it out, Japan released this amazing Ultra Q box set that had both the colorized versions and the non-colorized ver- the original black and white, and, you know, brand new like the Mill Creek scans are the best scans you can get here, hmm. but they had like even better scans. But of course it was Japanese prices. So it was like 400 bucks or $600. I can't remember how much it was over 200. I know that for a fact, but you know, <laughs> I couldn't really justify like, I like ultra Q, but sure. No, when no, no, I no, think course. about music equipment. I should probably buy instead. It would be silly of me, even though I, I my mouse hovered over that mm-hmm. put in the cart button. <laughs> <laughs> no no i'm 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 with you but, but uh, yeah i should not spend that much money on ultra q but it is really awesome i really like if i i think if you like this and you like gargantuas <laughs> ultra q might be your jam i know i've shilled for it before on this podcast but it just reminded me again i'm uh, really torn about about um all right i i'm really torn about something though in the you know speaking of baragon so part of me says it's a kaiju movie, so if you're gonna have one kaiju, you gotta have another so they can fight. Because there are certain requirements of the genre, just like there's certain requirements of ballet or or a haiku or or anything. But on the other hand, it uh, if I come in from another perspective and I don't know any of that stuff, it sure seems like it's not necessary. Like you could probably tell the story of this giant no, Frankenstein. I, I agree with you. You are right. Technically, you are right. And honestly, like the original Godzilla and Godzilla 1985 only have Godzilla in them. And yeah. they're both fine. You don't yeah. Have, yeah. always have to have another kaiju. But uh, but we've said many possible. times that, that, that when people, you know, one of, the, one of the mistakes people make in adapting things is they'll go, hey, you know, let's have Spider-Man, but uh, 
you know, it's too much to ask of the audience for there to be also other flying heroes. So let's just have Spider-Man and he can fight jewel thieves or something. You know, in other words, there's a tendency to go smaller than you need to. So I'm torn. I'm basically trying to figure out whether this movie would be better if there were no Baragon. I think um, the Frankenstein story is interesting enough. And the fact that it is like a weird variation yeah. on Frankenstein, I I am... I would be absolutely fine with them cutting out Baragon, except that the fight scenes with Frankenstein and Baragon are awesome. Okay, so let's yeah. let's talk about that because that's well, the last major thing. The, well, the also yeah. you know you have all this misunderstanding between them when they finally. I mean, it's well into the movie before somebody comes forward and goes. By the way, I know you probably don't know this, but there's a Baragon, right. and I saw it. <laughs> And here's the proof. And they eventually kind of show you that. And that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, And then, but, you know, without that also that you don't get the, where everybody kind of goes, oh, and Frankenstein saves the doctor. Right. Who's been, who goes like, I'm going after Frankenstein. And then goes, oh, crap, a Baragon. Right. (laughs) Throw grenades at it. Holy (laughs) crap. I did not expect this. No one did, except the town that got smashed by a Baragon. Now, I always wondered, so there's that happens, and they're like, oh, it must have been uh, this Frankenstein. But there's got to be giant Baragon prints. Well, no, he travels under the earth. No, no, but when he he smashes the town, he doesn't travel under the earth. Right. Yeah, he's got to so, come up and tramp around to eat cows and stuff. I mean, he he well, you, you I mean, know, he, he destroys a whole town. Yeah, the like best, straight up. The, the best scene of Paragon is when he just ate a bunch of chickens, and they show the next scene, and his like mouth is half open, and they actually have feathers. Oh, that was mouth. great! I mean, they're doing so much cool, fun monster stuff with that. But yeah, so he saves, you know, he saves the doctor, and then goes, "I've had enough." It's time for it's time for us to fight, and then monster wrestling ensues. Yes, but what I think the fact that you have like a more human type monster <laughs> is what makes this interesting, though, because like you know we've seen dinosaurs, we've seen giant apes, we've seen you know to- Toho has had you know tons of you know every mutated thing you can think of, giant insects. Uh, you know, but like this is a giant Frankenstein, so it's a kind of a giant person. So he's a little smarter than yes. that. So he'll do crazy stuff like, okay, I'm gonna go grab a couple of trees and light them on fire and beat this, you know, dinosaur thing with yes. that. And he's he's you know, there's also something about because he looks more human. Like when you watch <laughs> the way he like emotes and and kind of. Cu- I don't know. I did, there's just something really cool about that. Yes. Right. Plus, when he starts really going, it's interesting because you've seen him kind of have growing pains and he's very, he kind of lumbers a little bit. Yes. And he, he walks around, but once he's fighting Baragon, he's really <laughs> spry. Yes. Like he's running up rocks and ripping stuff up and he, he feels more, he's already dressed in this kind of, you know, fur loincloth. He's a, he's a more tarzan kind of. Yes fighter at this point which is i mean you can't do that in a suit like those huge suits you can't do that so there's a different aspect exactly what you're talking about drew where you know he can run up a cliff and go yeah dan and he's he's so much faster than baragon even though baragon can shoot honest breath laser breath honestly like i hope the people who do the new king kong versus godzilla looked at this movie because like this is in a lot of ways (laughs) kind of what a a a modern king kong versus godzilla because like the question is always like oh how can king kong fight godzilla godzilla has a breath weapon this is Mm -hmm. how like like i'm with you you and I don't know, man. Like, I just think this is one of the best, like, you know, we talked about back when we were doing Godzilla movies over the summer and we talked about Godzilla versus Megalon and, you know, how that kind of like the real awesome saving grace of that movie is like the fighting. <laughs> yeah, I monster think this, wrestling. Yeah, yeah, this is some of the best, in, you know, to me, some of the best fight fight scenes in any Toho movie. Like, these, these are just really... You know, and it's not even big name monsters, although, like, I kind of wish, like, I know we get War of the Gargantulas, but the Gargantulas are kind of, even though they're the offspring of Frankenstein, they're kind of their own thing. I yeah. kind of wish that they had done more adventures with this version of Frankenstein, because I think he's cool. Like, well, and, I, and I, they easily could, because, first of all, they've already established that he has Wolverine powers. He'll regenerate, you know, no matter what. 
Um, you know, and so at the end of this, both the ending that we saw plus the extra endings that we saw on YouTube, he could come back. They could come, they, Toho could bring him back next year to fight Shin Godzilla easily. You know, they just haven't. Shin Frankenstein. Hell yeah, absolutely. I'm, man, I want to make that. <laughs> I mean, you know, by the way, the character, the concept and the character, perfectly public domain. You could, you could, you could do this in a heartbeat. There's nothing. Yeah, I don't understand why they didn't, you know, like even when they did War of the Gargantuas, they even went to the, so far as to like, in Japan, they're called Frankenstein 1 and Frankenstein 2. But when they yes. moved it to America, they made them Gargantuas, even though like the name Frankenstein would probably sell better. In... I think uh, at that time, I, I think they decided that it hadn't actually done there. Well. There's yeah. a whole thing with that. And I, again, it's been written up and there's articles about it and I've read them and since I'm terrible because I could really bring that trivia here and I'm not mm-hmm. <laughs> my, my brain is much lately, but there is a lot, there's a lot written about it. Um, why it was Frankenstein, why it wasn't perceived as yes, we should make them Frankenstein again. Um, and also selling it internationally had a big part in that. Um, you know, what, what was perceived as, Oh, that's more universal. This is seen as mon- these kind of monster movies, and that kind of keeping them separated in that licensing. Um, also, you know, sometimes people just make they think that it should be one way, and maybe that's a mistake later. Oh yeah, I mean, people executives make boneheaded, you know, highly, basically highly considered completely wrong mistakes all the time they probably went through all kinds of of conversations about you know are the kids more likely to go see it at the drive-in if it says frankenstein or if it doesn't say frankenstein they finally decided ah research tells us it shouldn't say frankenstein and so and so there you go i i want another movie with with giant radioactive frankenstein that's all i know like i and if I have to make it myself, that probably that probably won't happen because I don't know anything really about filmmaking except for like trivia. But I, like, I, I well, first of all, you have a comic book, so you could introduce giant radioactive <laughs> Frankenstein like next week. <laughs> I mean, we did get the Hanna Barbera Frankenstein Junior. in yes. the Impossible show, which yeah. has a friendly Frankenstein monster. That's true, but not you know. I would much prefer I really, this one. I really want to see Frankenstein versus Godzilla. Actually, Legendary Pictures just remake this for the MonsterVerse. Right. I want to see. I want to see that. You know, like I, I like this version of Frankenstein like a lot. And the, I, I just want to mention this hilarious thing where uh, after he fights Baragon, <laughs> Tony, you pointed this out. There is a version where he fights Baragon. And then lumbering out of the hills for no reason at all <laughs> is a giant octopus. And so the characters, you know, Sueco goes, oh, it's a giant octopus. And Frankenstein fights the giant octopus. There is no reason for this to happen other than that the producers had a giant octopus suit that they wanted to make. And so so here it is. And, and Well, no, that was it was requested for the international release <laughs> it just, it's, like, so... but it's such a like by the way here's a here's an octopus and as drew put it really nicely a tactopus yes yes a tactopus it just um, lowers guys... out like hey, an yeah. encore i just wanted Even to know the water are... look it's a frankenstein i guess i should attack him and I, I wasn't here before. Where did they it. come from? They're in the Alps. I know. Well, That's what I'm saying. <laughs> it's like, it's like I, uh, I heard there was fire. Octopus really like fire, right? Uh, here, I'm just coming up for uh, this barbecue, right? It only makes sense if the octopus had earlier come up out of the water because there's a cliff and there's water. If the octopus had earlier come out of the water, wandered inland, like on, you know, to well, buy some kites. I mean, to an octopus you, picnic, and then now is wandering back well, just as Frankenstein finishes fighting. But think him. about it. This is another yeah. one of those things. So Saperstein goes, it needs a giant octopus. <laughs> <laughs> and then they make it, and he reviews the... I mean, if you believe kind of how the story goes, he reviews the footage and goes, uh, we're going to cut that. The octopus wasn't that good. Like, you think? <laughs> like, it, if, you, if you were going to do that, what you would do is have an octopus fight like the one in king kong the new king kong yes. right which is amazing yeah and then he throws it on land 
and you go, well, I guess Octopus is dead, right? You yes. do that earlier in the movie, and then later on, ha ha, I'm back. At least yeah. that makes some sense, rather than like, hey guys, I hear there's a barbecue. Oh, so- look, Frankenstein. <laughs> Octopi, How? Octopi hate Frankenstein. I guess it's not for us to fight. And then they <laughs> fall off, and everybody's like, "Yeah, well, I mean, he fought an octopus, but you know, he regenerates." So I'm sure the How? octopus didn't get the best of. How him. traumatizing do you think it is to be a person in the Toho verse when, the, when in any given moment, some kind of giant creature is going to come lumbering out? Because that's just, just like. You know, we talk about the tropes of these movies, but that's just kind of where so, we're at. By the way, there was a uh, there's a video game kind of about that. Um, I think it's called City on the Edge of Shadows, hmm. where it's basically there were uh, um, there were disaster games mm-hmm. uh, where you dealt with oh, there's a flood, there's a you know towering inferno, etc. And they decided uh, to make one where basically this level is a uh, city sh- shrouded in shadow. Mm-hmm. Um, this, but it never could come out in the states because there was like one level that's Ultraman, one level mm-hmm. that's Godzilla, etc. You can watch playthroughs of it. Um, it's up for the PS4, but it is just that when you're a human dealing with, oh look, it's cool that Ultraman's saving us, but while he's doing that, he's <laughs> destroying the hell out of my apartment complex yes or the this office building i work at um the thing i always come back to is not only would it be scary because at any given time a kaiju could come just tromping out of the wherever yeah. um but i always hope that if you're in the godzilla the anti-godzilla task force like you pilot a jet or you are in a maser cannon tank that i really hope the japanese government subsidizes their life insurance like (laughs) i want to believe hopefully that this is is that any family member of a person in the godzilla task force gets a free ride to school um has a has a has a trust fund allocated because you when you're called to service you are most likely going to die that's very much how the <laughs> how the godzilla is presented in the g-force movie that we saw you know uh, where i'm trying to remember now which godzilla movie this was but you know where there's this, there's this whole very very organized group of of godzilla fighters you know, I can imagine. Yeah, but they whole... never deal with like. By the way, no, it doesn't. It doesn't deal with it at all. That's true. But... <laughs> by the way, I just hope that every every person on the anti Godzilla task force. Now I realize that that's your your duty for your nation, but I would say, as far as danger goes, <laughs> kaiju fighting is a fairly one way ticket. You know what so... strikes me is no, absolutely. But I mean, I. First of all, I think you're exactly right. Uh, I was thinking about how strange it is that so many of these Japanese monsters, you know, with the exception of a bunch of stuff like the mushroom people and whatever, but these monsters are so giant that you can't really do much of anything. There are some movies where there are the fighters, you know, but usually right. you're right. They're just cannon fodder. There's nothing you can do about I it. I mean, you're doing it to help. They're hoping to stave off this. But right. once a maser cannon doesn't work three years ago. Right. There's not a significant improvement in maser technology. See, this is now, the, now the this, which means that there's a whole. By the way, there's a whole <laughs> support group of widows and widowers. Yes, of uh, people in the anti Godzilla task force. Well, absolutely. But I mean, I, I was thinking about the fact that, like, if you go back to '54, so Godzilla is a stand-in for atomic atomic explosions, right? Right. It's so big that that you and I, Tony, we we don't we don't really amount to anything up against something that big. We're just tiny people, and, and it's this enormous thing. And it's interesting to me that much more than in the United States, the Japanese have embraced a world where there are these forces that are so large that man can only comment and and point and run you well know. isn't See, that this a, is, i mean that's this that's is, a to be honest with you that's one of the differences between 54 godzilla and the american godzilla right if you look at the american godzilla there's always the marine who thinks he can beat it right 
And I think it and is that's a built out of that's that a experience. totally different tone. I like both, but that's a totally different tone yeah. than the we are against a hurricane. Yeah. And it's right. it's really it's and it's worth noting. It's worth how that happens and how that's viewed is so tonally different. Yeah. Um, even though I enjoy both. I mean now Godzilla eventually you know, we send a we send a jet jaguar to help him and sure. they monster wrestle, but well, I, it becomes more uh, abstracted. Yeah, I bad, want to see. I want to see. See, here's the backdoor pilot for the Frankenstein conquers the world reboot. Frankenstein, because he is more human than the other monsters, can be reasoned with and be sent to fight other kaiju. Yes, <laughs> I, I this this must happen to the I, oh I mean, man to the point where they eventually kind of like give him a monster fighting suit yeah oh, i like kinda, that mecha kinda, mecha he's style. uncomfortable where so eventually he's going to end up just maybe not in the fur loincloth but something way more stripped down right mm-hmm. but somebody at some point is going to do the thing where they go i think if we just give the frankenstein monster this suit we've got scientists who and it's full of just stuff that weighs him down and isn't very helpful <laughs> and eventually of course all of that's stupid because who would know better how to fight monsters than the frankenstein monster himself the frankenstein it rips I it all like off and, and kicks ass yeah and even though that's a trope we've seen a bunch i would watch it again i would certainly make it if Heck, any, yeah. anybody from toho or legendary or anybody involved with the godzilla franchise somehow miraculously here's this podcast i'm <laughs> pleading with you right now bring in giant radioactive frankenstein so i can die happy it's so funny the only way that they would do something like that is if they could disguise it sufficiently that only people in the know would go oh i get it this is their variation on giant frankenstein because i don't those know movies, man yeah. i don't know man Godzilla King of the Monsters had quite a bit of fan service in it. I guess that's true, but mm-hmm. it, they, those things take themselves so seriously that it's hard to envision like a a jet jaguar, much much less a giant Frankenstein. It's not uh, impossible, but well, we'll I, see. I mean, I suppose we'll see. there is there is many a rumor of Mecha Godzilla in Kong versus Godzilla, sir. <laughs> um, no, but but. Yeah, uh, I I do think Tony that 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 attitude, you know, that you're up against a hurricane, and it gets watered down in some of the later ones. So you know, this isn't this is not a perfect uh, this is not a perfect description, but that attitude is because of the atomic experience. So even though oh, these movies get farther and farther away, United States never had that. We didn't have we had 9/11, which is a crime that killed 3,000 people. And it completely disrupted us for a decade, but we never had New York just get wiped off the map. And I think if, if we had, it would change our, it would change a lot of stuff, but it would certainly change our art. And Mm -hmm. so you're looking at, you're looking at an art that was changed by something. I mean, even as we watch a a kind of a silly Baragon and a, you know, flat top, immortal, regenerating Wolverine, (laughs) Frankenstein, yeah. you still have at the beginning a a ward of cancer patients yes. who were whose parents were irradiated yep. in the bomb. That's how we I, begin this movie. Yeah. I think I think it's, that's that's like a really good point. Like like these kind of monster movies, they they walk that line between um being very dark, being very silly, and being very sublime. Yeah. And sometimes all in the same movie. And I, think I like the deliberateness of that word, sublime. That's very, very, very exactly chosen. Yeah, be, and I, I totally agree with you, Drew. Also, because there's some sublime parts in the in the way that in the the King Kong hom- homage, for example, and then later in the the humanity of even though this is a beast man <clears throat> that's growing out of control, we still should feel compassion. Mm-hmm. Um, and and just the insanity of a, a Frankenstein arm, that, a hand that can crawl around, and then a guy goes, just, "Well, we have the hand. I, I sure could use more regenerative parts." There, like, yeah, no kidding. Can you give yeah. me a little bit more? He's like, "No, we should. That that's not what we should do." <laughs> Yeah. Um, I, I, I should mention, though, there's an argument against what I said, because I was saying that this fascination with giant monsters is born of, of the Hiroshima experience, experience. but actually, um, I think you can make that argument, but at the same time, Godzilla was very influenced by King Kong. And we had our own giant monster period, which we spent a whole summer on, 
which is the the 1950s giant monster, you know, the irradiated giant big bug stuff. Um, yeah, but even then, you can see our difference. Other yeah, very than, much. Other than them, which feels like, oh, what have we done? Right. Not the triumph of the American spirit even is in that with yeah. all the soldiers. You can but it also be- carries over into Beasts from 20,000 Fathoms and um, Gila Monster, mm-hmm. where the hu- the human spirit is a bunch of rockabilly kids, you know, hot rod kids. Yeah. See what, these, see what the youth of today can do? And it's vastly different from if this yeah. thing happens we we can try and we'll do our best to to take it out but and you'll usually win whereas in a japanese movie you can try and do your best but basically you're going to try and do your best to survive and another elemental force will probably i mean 85 85 they they you know and 64 yeah they take them out kong like you know like Think about the difference, even the way Kong is when, when you know, he's imported j- to Japan, yep. you know, like, cause like Kong is easily taken out by some biplanes in the original King Kong, but suddenly, yeah. you know, he's <laughs> the, s- the size of the empire state building and bulletproof yeah. and, you know, fighting <laughs> dinosaurs and giant, d- giant Godzilla. He's always fighting dinosaurs, but fighting Godzilla and then, you know, giant robot versions of himself, you know, right. like, and like, can be regenerated by lightning. Yeah. Like or electricity, these, I guess. These are very much um, giant monsters in American movies are problems to be dealt with. Um, and, you know, they're problems. You know, I think I think you know the best example of this actually. You know, you know, we just brought up you know bringing Kong into Japan, and they basically make Kong a god yeah. because the monsters monsters are very godlike in in yeah. the Japanese movies. Um, you, you look at when when they, the first time they tried to import Godzilla over here, they turned him into a big iguana, and they they kill him on the Brooklyn Bridge. Yeah, and you know that's. That's again because monsters, giant monsters specifically, are are problems to be dealt with. You know, yeah. the, the American military can deal with it. You know, even this movie, like F- Frankenstein, is a Western concept. He's not American, but you know, like he's certain America has certainly left their stamp on Frankenstein, yeah. and you know, suddenly you you bring Frankenstein over to Japan and he's this gigantic godlike metaphor for all these things. Yes. Yeah. A lumbering, clumsy, Caucasian thing that steps on people and occasionally gets blamed for stuff they didn't do. But generally I mean he did that. eat those dogs and stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. By the way, I love Just the moment. Survive. I love the moment when when the uh, school kids come into the in the village where he's hanging out. They come in, they're like, "Oh, we're gonna feed the rabbits," and then they go. They look down, and there's a bunch of rabbit heads because he ate a bunch of rabbits and didn't eat the heads. And so they go, Wah! and they all run away. It is great. It's a moment of pure, although weird and sicko, comedy. You know, right. as these kids run from the from the the rabbit heads. Um, that's a. That's but then a cool we moment. we move that into or i guess that's after the baragon attack um, which is being kind of blamed because the, the I, uh, yeah no it's also interesting too because when he starts out and he's been a legend that they yeah. even call back to the war because there were people who were so uh that's right i mean it was so yeah. terrifying and people go oh yeah i i mean i the older guy goes i remember when there were people stealing other people's dogs because that's all they could get to eat yeah, he's not I'm talking sorry. about people left on the island he's talking about friends and neighbors possibly or people I didn't know as well. Like there were feral people because, or people who were in that amount of hardship that that's all they could get. Yeah. Um, you know, you're talking like great with the fireflies kind of stuff. That's, that's profound. Yeah. And it, I mean that that's, it's, it's so strange that you've got this monster movie again. I had forgotten how much meat there was. I mean, this is even the English language version. Yeah. Which I haven't, like I said, I haven't seen the subtitled version in forever. No, but that's, that's a really profound I need to thought. Hunt it down. I, I hadn't thought about that. You know, how much these people have have situated in the past this profound trauma that drove people to starvation and killed people for years with cancer. And also the fact that they're willing to uh, contextualize it such that Nick Adams' character, people don't treat, this is a movie, but people don't treat Nick Adams as somebody who doesn't deserve to be like in the room or or shouldn't be the star of the movie. I just, I just find that fascinating, you know, that, that, uh, that, that they can both talk about those traumas and not associate those traumas with a character who is there, who said he participated in them. 
Right. All right. Uh, I also I mean, think it's, it's, uh, com- yeah, it's complicated. It's complex. Yes. It's more complex than I think when people think about stuff, they think in general, I would say a lot, a lot of people think more about the Godzilla versus Megalon style from this era than they would a, all of the stuff we've been talking about, uh, yeah. all the things wrapped into world war two. Yeah. Um, it's surprising and it's effective and it's complicated and it's easy also for us to generalize just, you know, three. I think it makes people uncomfortable to, to mix things up like that. You know, people, I, I, I think it's very possible that people might go, no, if I'm going to have a fun monster movie, I don't want a nod towards traumatic stuff, you know? And, and so I think it feels weird for a lot of people to, to sort of mix these two. I think it's cool. Personally, and I'll fully admit suggesting. that there's stuff that, that I'm, you know, it's easy to generalize or to gloss over and, and there could be people going, Hey, well, what you don't understand is also X, Y, and Z. Sure. So this is a generalization this way. And as a, you know, well, also your mileage but, may vary. I think if it's very possible that if you just like, you know, we talked about if you have little kids, you might not want to watch something where a little kid gets tortured, right? So you personally, me personally, a viewer might not be into something, but that doesn't mean that the art's not super effective for like everybody else in the room. So, you know, I don't know. Interesting. Uh, I also wanted to point out if Huckabee's music is fabulous. I, I, there's, there's, uh, this is the guy who did the music for Godzilla and every music cue in this movie feels like a, it's, it's just, it's just like how in hammer, all the music sounds precisely the same, same thing here. And it's, it's delightful, you know, all the, all the cues, all the horns, everything. I just loved it. Yeah, no, it's, it's a fantastic score. One of my yeah. cats hates whistling and some certain noises though. So at the beginning <laughs> he was just going, what is going on? There's certain soundtracks where his ears just kind of go a little crazy. It was kind of funny. That's but awesome. yeah, this this score was really good. I enjoy it, you know, and he does such a good job of the um, intro themes and then somber calls back. And then when it comes to doing a march. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He is. Yeah. All master. the military marches, like whenever you see the, oh, he's the, such, the he's army. so masterful. <laughs> I know. It's fantastic. It really is. Um, uh, okay. Is there anything that else else that we want to mention about Frankenstein Conquers the World? And we will be back next week with War of the Gargantuas. Oh, we should also um, mention at the end. So there's like the three endings. There's oh. one where he sinks in a sinkhole. Yeah. And everybody goes, oh, that's terrible. He sunk in a sinkhole. <laughs> we'll never get the science back. Or I hope he's okay. And one, one scientist goes... Oh, I mean, he's immortal, so yeah. maybe this is for the best. And then there's another one where he he just brutalizes Baragon, snaps his neck. Yes. And <laughs> and then there's the third one, which we talked about with the octopus, where <laughs> ill-advised, let's just add an octopus. Put, put, a, bird, <laughs> put a bird on it. <laughs> what? Yeah, lest you think that the people who make these movies can't make mistakes. They did, in fact you know plan and write and shoot build and shoot an octopus for the scene that they ended up deciding that was dumb i refuse to call it anything other than a tactopus a tactopus i actually really like that that sounds good so yes um and that's and that's the end of frankenstein conquers the world uh so yes but really it only stays in japan yeah that's true it's a meaningless (laughs) the 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 japanese called it frankenstein versus baragon and you know, it's a perfectly fine, although, again, super random that, that you know, I don't know it, I, I, yeah, I can't believe this movie exists. I can't believe I never got around to seeing it until last night. That's just amazing to me. Well, they haven't made it easy. We'll be, let's be honest. Right. But you can see it for free on archive.org. So that's the place to, to watch it. And know? I would gladly pay, if somebody puts out the Blu-ray of this, it's an insta buy. Sure. Yeah. That's one of the most frustrating things I think about all the licensing stuff is you'll get something where you just just point me to where I I don't I want to give people the money. Yeah. Point me to where I send people cash. (laughs) Okay, I have an example for you. I Uh, just watched. um, uh, So uh, I'm sorry. No, I I was uh, talking on Facebook about how I was looking for the Star Trek comics from the 90s because there were all these comics from the 90s that DC Mm -hmm. put out 
that had basically just a whole other continuity. It's just, they just completely ignored. It picked up after Star Trek II uh, or Star Trek. No, yeah, no, it picked up after Star Trek II. And basically Kirk is running around. Savick replaces Spock and, you know, lots of stories. It's just a whole, because you got one every month. And it was really good. It was Mike W. Barr, the guy who wrote Batman and the Outsiders and a bunch of stuff. And uh, it's basically not available you can't find it you know it's not on the dc app and some of it you know like just like a couple issues of it are in a trade paperback the rest of it not available so how am i going to read it i can buy back issues okay you know that's not an impossible thing to do or you and can read some because you're supporting you know your local comic shop support, yes. or mail order you know whatever you know that's it that is the only legit so-called way to read those other than that bootleg that's it and I, that's crazy. <laughs> Things should be available. There's no particular reason that should not, you know. So I don't know. I, uh, I, I, I'm just agreeing with you and using a, a very particular example. But multiply that by like a billion because there's so, so many things that we should be able to get our hands on that are not available right now. Yeah. And I mean, there's many reasons why, but it's still the only thing that makes me mad is when a thing becomes available and then people still don't support that. That's true and make excuses i don't i don't dig on that but anyway but yeah, yeah man it, i i really enjoyed it. i'm i'm glad we did this and got to talk about it because yes it was no, this cool. was fun yeah it is available by the way it looks like frankenstein conquers the world is on it you said it's a 30 dollar dvd it must be out of print yeah and That's i should probably do that but i really wish that somebody would rescue the blu-ray there is a yeah. japanese blu-ray but it didn't make it over here so i know we're going to get together again in like three days but um uh because we're gonna we're gonna cover invasion of the body snatchers 1978 crossover uh, episode in fact oh my gosh yes yeah we're gonna hang out with the uh, monster movie happy hour guys on a crossover episode i'm super excited um is there anything that you would like to uh, endorse before then or, or just check in on in on, or, or check in like it's a 12 set meeting? I'm sorry, but like, no, anything that you'd like to talk about, let me know. I know I that, have. Go ahead, Drew. Correct. Well, very selfishly, extremely selfishly. I want everybody who hears my voice and I'm going to be <laughs> doing this a lot over the next few weeks because okay. I've decided I'm just going to go for this, even though the odds are not really in my favor as they usually are um go to the ringo awards ringoawards.com mm. and nominate me drew edwards as best <laughs> comic book writer and nominate halloween man for best superhero for this Hell yeah because yeah. i want to win a ringo award for uh for our 20th anniversary which is coming up in october you know and if the world doesn't end we're still gonna have that and it would be cool to accomplish some of these things so uh yeah uh you know and you can nominate some other comic book people that you dig on there as well get them some some love but uh even if you're not that into comic books and you just like hearing me ramble on about monster movies on this podcast uh i've never asked anything of you here's something I, I, you can do for me <laughs> i think you should totally campaign i think it's a good idea and and yes i totally nominated you absolutely so yeah Fantastic. all right that's that's I will probably repeat this on on Sunday, but uh, yeah, that's that's where I'm at. Um, Tony, do you have anything to endorse? Um, man, there was something I was thinking about. Now I can't remember. Oh, um, oh, I do know. Oh, Criterion announced a Bruce Lee box set, and I'm super stoked about that. Oh, War of the Worlds. They're actually War of the uh, Worlds, which the uh, OG, um, like George George Powell. Yeah, the George Worlds? Powell War of the Worlds 4K restoration. Mm. Wow. No, that sounds cool. That's that's sexy. Yeah, I'm mm, again like and shares a cast time, member. I should not shares I should... a cast member with the movie we just watched. Yeah, because but Paul man, I'm, is yeah, I'm super yes. stoked about all that. Um, trying to think what else. Uh, I oh, I will say as I love good customer service. Um, I ordered one of my favorite bands since the late '80s, Metal Church. Um put out a new record and there was a glitch in one of my orders. I, it was such a good, I bought their new one. It was so good mm -hmm. that I went back. It's a place called Rat Pack. 
Records, R A T P A K. Mm-hmm. And there was a glitch, and they were so on it and so cool and so fast. Because there's a song I really like called Fake Healer, and they made a Fake Healer, Return of the Fake Healer comic book. And I mm. love heavy metal comics. So I was like, why didn't I order this before? So I ordered that immediately, or and they had such great customer service, and their packaging is amazing. Um, if you're into metal and all, especially if you like metal church, cause these new releases are great. Uh, Rat Pack <coughs> records. I'm, I'm a lifetime fan now because they were just so cool about everything and super fast in a world where maybe I still feel a twinge when I order something non-essential through the post. Cause mm-hmm. you know, it's, uh, we try not to do that through Amazon. Explain to me a little more. Are, are, are you talking about not, um, not inundating the post with with unnecessary yeah, like DVDs and whatever random dumb shit that I enjoy, you know. Keeping the supply chain to essentials. Okay. And you know, there's stuff I have pre-ordered that is coming through and I've seen people griping about, oh my pre-order for this is late. It's like man, do you understand what is that exactly going so on? So let me be let me be ignorant for a second. Aren't they already doing that that uh that delaying uh, prior- Aren't they doing that prioritizing on their own? In other words, couldn't you go ahead and just order whatever you like and they can just Right. But you know. again, there's less of that factor. Right. You're also uh you've got people in warehouses working yeah. to send you this stuff and they're putting themselves on the line. You also and I, I'm part of the problem because I still have a Prime account or whatever. You have yeah. a, a billionaire who's not, who's made billions, millions upon millions during this whole thing, and yet had a Kickstarter to help his workers. Isn't you know? that crazy? Yeah. I mean, look, I, I'm not doing enough. I'll tell you that. I, I realize that, and it sucks. And I've been trying to figure out how I can do more. Um, you know what, what will work the best, but. None of these people have come up as Batman in all of this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, so no, that's heavier than probably we should get into, but I just, you know, but when you have a company that's willing, like ships super fast and is really cool about things and, and with all the craziness going on, um, I just think it's good to give a shout out to the people. My, my, one of my MOs is there's a lot of bastard people out there. Mm-hmm. A lot. And they're bastards every day. So the people who are cool have to be like two or three times as cool. Yeah. Because we have to counteract bastard people. And in some narrative, I'm probably the bastard person to somebody because none of us are heroes all the time. God knows. But but, uh, yeah. So and I also think like usually you hear the bad things Mm -hmm. about people. It's, It's easy to be negative. But if something's good you see less genuinely like good reviews because service was done, you know? Yeah. Right. So I try when I can to go, Hey, here's a, here's a place or a company or a person or a band or whatever, who's really doing good stuff. And they're really like putting positive energy out there and, and putting out good works and, Bending over backwards for customer service, whatever, you know. So Rat Pack. That's a, that's a really excellent point. This week is my, you know, they're awesome. Well, thank you. And they're putting out cool music. And that's that's what's bringing me <coughs> to, that. that's what keeps me from going kind of crazy is good music and good people doing good things. Wow. We should all be so lucky if we know some of those people. I I, I can't, um, I can't top that. That was really good. So that's, that's fabulous. I mean, I don't know if you top it. I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're again pontificating at the end of the episode so whatever but yeah no, i think it's i think it's great uh well actually if you're going to be around on sunday again invasion of the body snatchers 78 with monster movie happy hour who just put up a new episode this week on creature from the black lagoon which i have not listened to yet but between now and then i will have listened to it because we we did a a really fun series on creature i loved that conversation loved it loved it it's like two years ago now right but uh so i really want to hear hear them discuss that movie and and uh i'm looking forward to that conversation so it'll be cool um well thank you guys for helping keep me sane inside uh uh this weird quarantine period and i hope you are excellent to one another and for the listeners i hope you are you know staying safe and 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 filling your your mind with really fascinating sometimes beautiful things and uh everybody have a lovely evening bye everybody good night good night, good night.